I, uh, uh, I'm resisting the urge right now to say, may it please the court. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this is sort of like the ultimate en banc hearing, I guess, isn't it? Um, my name is Bill Anderson. I practice with Carl Amore in Washington, D.C. Um, some of you probably woke up this morning, looked at your uh, program, and said, good God in heaven, how can they start us off with asbestos <laughs> first thing in the morning? If you're like me, most of you have probably spent most of your careers avoiding asbestos litigation any way you could. Uh, I did that for about 15 years, and then a partner of mine uh, pulled me into this world uh, from uh, a world of product liability and toxic tort litigation. And um, since then, I've been steeped in the science of asbestos cases and how it works. Well, here's, I, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I suspect that most of you have never handled an asbestos case. They usually go to one judge on a docket or, or uh, something like that. And I don't want to spend the morning you know, telling you arcania about cases you don't deal with, but I think that all of us are going to give you points that you will find very relevant to any product liability, any toxic tort, any environmental causation case. The principles are very similar. Um, and uh, this is a, I'll offend the Californians here if there's anyone from California. Asbestos is kind of like California. There's a lot of weird things that go on in California. <laughs> But we all have to pay attention because they end up showing up in our states, too, at some point. And that's how asbestos is. Uh, there are rules developed there that are highly unique. I, was, I have to tell you, I was shocked when I got started in this world and began to understand how courts make decisions in asbestos litigation. They're very different than what I was used to in traditional toxic tort and products liability cases. And I think as Professor Green may tell you in a few minutes, asbestos, uh, he just told me a few minutes ago, uh, has had a major influence on the third restatement of torts. So we'll do our best to broaden this for you a little bit, but I think you'll find some applicability. Um, let me give you some context for what I'm about to say about the every exposure theory. Uh, in times past, toxic tort cases and product cases to some degree were based on exposures that occurred generally prior to the 1970s. Uh, in that era, as we all know, many of us you know, lived through that, many of us watched uh, Howdy Doody on television, and I won't ask for a show of hands for that either. Uh, the exposures were substantial in those, back, in those days back then, especially to asbestos. There was a lot of things going on that either through lack of education or lack of attention in some cases or lack of knowledge because the science hadn't developed yet, there were things happening. Uh, so there have been lots of toxic tort cases based on uh, relatively high exposures. What is happening today though is since the advent of OSHA and EPA, most of those exposures have gone away. And we have a world today where the exposures we incur are much different than that old era. They're far lower in quantity and in extent. Uh, at the same time, our science has progressed to the point that we can now detect things in our blood, in water, in the air at far lower levels than we ever could before. So you have a world where it's known that we are exposed to and have things in our bodies, but the levels are much, much lower. The engine that drives tort um, law is exposure and causation. That's what it's all about. And so the key today is for the plaintiff law firms that uh, deal with these cases to come up with ways to convince courts and juries that low-dose exposures are a cause of disease. And what we're running into is you're getting into the extreme gray area of science. Uh, epidemiology is the gold standard of science and can take causation theories down to a certain, uh, causation understanding down to a certain level. When you get past a certain point, you reach this level of exposure where epidemiology doesn't work very well anymore and you're into the gray world. And that's where most tort litigation exists today is in that gray world. Courts struggle a lot with how to decide, should I let this expert testify to this theory or not? It's a, it's a very difficult world. Science struggles with that as well. Um, so that's the context. The every exposure theory, as you see on the screen here, has been around for quite a while in asbestos litigation. And I'll, I'll show you what it means in just a few minutes. Just let me talk about it first. Um, the, the theory has been around for quite a while, but in the old days when most of the defendants, I'm sorry, most of the plaintiffs were people who sprayed asbestos insulation, people who worked in Navy shipyards, people who ripped old ships apart, uh, people who worked in asbestos factories, it really didn't matter. The exposures in those situations are pretty bad. 
And so you end up with um, uh, plenty of evidence to support a case. Today the litigation has changed dramatically. The people who are being sued today are uh, the automotive industry, for instance, over brake jobs, including hobby jobs in the backyard, and it doesn't take very many to get one named as a defendant. Uh, gasket removal off engines or other surfaces, uh, which doesn't have a lot of asbestos in it, but there is some exposure and other what I would call very low-level asbestos exposures. That's where the world is today. And we are struggling in that world with how do you deal with causation concepts when the exposures are at that realm. Um, there is a sea change underway in that world, and it's a world that I've been chasing and, and filing amicus briefs in and other things. It has to do with this every exposure theory. Uh, the plaintiff experts who routinely testify in these cases, and there are maybe a dozen or so who are common names to those of us who work here, had testified for years without really being touched uh, by the judiciary. They were allowed to express their opinions in almost every case. Since 2004, there have been a series of opinions that have either excluded their testimony altogether or severely restricted it because of their reliance on the every exposure theory. And for those who practice in the asbestos world, you can't imagine how dramatic it is to see an opinion come out excluding Sam Hammer's testimony. Sam Hammer is uh, the epitome of the plaintiff's causation experts in these cases. It's, it's extremely dramatic. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about today, and I'll give you a little context of how it may apply in some of your cases um, as we go along. This um, rather frightening-looking individual is Paracelsus. Um, he is a Renaissance-era um, scientist, philosopher, and uh, gadfly, as far as I can tell, uh, uh, had a colorful history. But he came up with the um, principle of toxicology that today is still the primary principle of toxicology. Everything's poisonous, it just depends on the dose. And the examples are legion, I won't you know, go through tons of them, but here's a few for you. Uh, you, may, you know, water, you may have read about the frat student who died from water intake in a hazing incident, water can kill you. Uh, aspirin, beer, etc. Some of you may be looking at beer and thanking your lucky stars because you came awfully close to that toxic limit in college. I don't... <laughs> 33 beers, is that all? <laughs> uh, um, Myself, I was more interested in the lima beans. I wish I had had that information when I was six years old. Boy, I could have, I could have done some damage around the dinner table if I'd had that data right there. Uh, and I suspect if you put beets up here, it would only take two beets to be <laughs> lethal. It's, because I nearly died when I had to eat them. Uh, the reverse of this principle is also true, that things that we believe are toxic are not at low levels, and if you, you know, a couple of examples, carbon monoxide is very deadly. Everyone knows if you get locked in a car and the car keeps running, you're gonna die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Well, if any of you walk by a city bus today, you breathed carbon monoxide and you're not going to die from it. It's, there's, there is a dose issue involved with uh, virtually every single toxin. And that's the point that we have to start getting across in these cases, and it, we start with the principle of dose. That's what it's all about. Um, Cancers are a unique area, and I want to just say a word about that. Uh, the slide I have up is by a Professor David Eaton from uh, University of Washington, who has written what I think is the best primer for judges on how to deal with science issues, science causation issues in the courtroom. And I've included it on the website, so if you want to try to access it, feel free. Uh, Professor Eaton is not a common, he does testify some, but not very much. He's not a common uh, litigant or litig litigation expert, and he's done a very balanced and nice job of explaining principles of toxicology, dose, epidemiology, <clears throat> and other things. Several courts have relied on his article recently. Uh, the New York Court of Appeals cited it in the Parker Benzene case uh, and some others as well. Uh, for carcinogens, Many years ago, when we first started studying cancers and how they occur, in the laboratory they learned that a single application of a carcinogen could make a cell go haywire and develop into a tumor, and thus developed the one-hit theory. And the one-hit theory got translated into the, under, the sort of acceptance of the notion that if we were impacted by a carcinogen one time, that one time could cause us to get cancer. The one-hit theory is, to some degree, behind the every exposure theory, so it's important when you're talking about carcinogens like asbestos. Uh, 
the problem is the one-hit theory today is discredited. Uh, most researchers understand that in order to get cancer, you have to have multiple and repeated exposures, as Professor Eaton says in this quote. Uh, the reason for that is, believe it or not, our bodies are producing cancerous cells at the rate of about 100 a day. And many of these are just normal mutation errors from the complex process of trying to copy a, a gene code. Uh, the body has ways of dealing with that. The cells can repair themselves. There's a process called apoptosis where they kill themselves. There are other cells that can cause those cells not to replicate or to kill them off. And the whole thing is going on the whole time. It's like having an entire police force in your body and they're hard at work stopping cancers from occurring. So it really does take quite a substantial uh, effort to get cancer into the body. And I'm not, uh, just to give you context here, Arnold Brody is a, real, a very common plaintiff expert who testifies frequently. I deposed him about uh, six months ago, and he was happy to agree with everything I just told you. It's, it's part of fairly common science these days, and the plaintiff experts uh, do not uh, dispute that very much. Uh, so carcinogens, uh, dose still applies, I think would be the point there. Now, I've been waiting, you, uh, making you hold your breath. Here's the theory. Uh, Dr. Frank is a common proponent of the every exposure theory and one of its uh, stronger advocates. Uh, it's also stated, more simply, I guess, every exposure above background is a substantial factor in causing asbestos disease. You will see that over and over again in plaintiff's experts' reports. Uh, here's the way they articulate it. They'll start with the principle that there is no known safe dose of asbestos. You can find that statement in OSHA regulations, in EPA regulations, in World Health uh, Organization materials, in IARC materials. Uh, it's a common statement. It means that researchers have not been able to identify the level at which asbestos has been shown, proven, not to cause, uh, and I'll use mesothelioma as an example, uh, and I, I don't want to use too many arcane words. Mesothelioma is a particular cancer uh, strongly associated with asbestos uh, that is extremely deadly. It's usually deadly within one year. Um, mesothelioma requires less of a dose than the others, so I'll use that during my talk today just because it's the kind of the worst case scenario. Uh, so they start with the concept, there's no known safe dose. Uh, asbestos disease is cumulative in the sense that the disease comes from the buildup of fibers over time in your lung. Uh, it's, it's the accumulation of the fibers that can produce the disease, consistent with the cancer theory I just told you about, that it takes some, some work to get past the body's defenses. Therefore, every breath that puts fibers in your lungs, or every exposure, but not background exposure, is a substantial contributing factor to every asbestos-related disease. Let me say a word about the background for a second. Uh, all of these experts will agree that they will not come into court and testify that background exposure to asbestos is a cause of asbestos disease. By background, they mean the asbestos that's floating around in the air in cities and urban areas and places where there's naturally occurring asbestos that normal people breathe who have no known direct exposure to an asbestos product or situation. Now here's the shocker that most people don't know. If I, I promise you I won't do this today, if I could cut open your lungs <laughs> and look, I would find millions of asbestos fibers in all of your lungs and in mine too. It's because we've lived in a world where asbestos was used everywhere. There was quite a bit of it in the general atmosphere. And virtually everyone agrees that those amounts of fibers are not a known cause of asbestos disease. Uh, the experts who support this theory will agree with that. And yet, they will then turn around and say, any exposure to an occupational or para-occupational source of, of asbestos is a cause. And I have gone round and round with these experts over that principle in depositions to try to pin down what exactly they mean. Uh, some of them will use a minimum level that they take as the, quote, background level. They'll pick, they don't pick, they get it out of literature, but they use a number for background and then say anything above that number, which is a, an extremely low number, so it captures almost every uh, asbestos product in the market. Uh, some of them simply say if it's an exposure that's, uh, as Eugene Mark says, a special exposure, and every time he says that, I see church lady. <laughs> Anybody remember Church Lady from Saturday Night Live? 
Isn't that exposure special? Um, a special exposure, which he believes is one that, that is more than enough to cause disease, but it's very difficult to pin him down on, on how exactly he makes that determination. Um, so background is out, everything else is in. Now, uh, here's what's happened to that theory. And this is a little geography test for you. You have to guess what states those are. Uh, a couple of them should be pretty easy. Uh, these decisions are all since 2004, and there are actually a few more than this. I, I've started to lose count. I used to count them as they came along because it helped as I was in front of another judge to let that judge know that this was not unique when we were asking the judge to look at this theory closely, that it was happening elsewhere too. And so we, we kind of you know, put a string side in or something with all the opinions. Uh, uh, there's some, somewhere between 16 and 20 of these so far. And these are not in substantial courts. Uh, the Texas Supreme Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals twice, uh, the Federal Bankruptcy Court in Delaware, and a number of state courts elsewhere have rejected this theory. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is just, I'm just going to put up a series of five slides that have the ultimate conclusions, I, and I won't, I'm not going to read these to you. I just want you to see how they're reaching or what they're saying about the theory. And then we'll talk about the details of the theory in a minute. The Gregg case in Pennsylvania involved an auto mechanic, and the suit was not against the, well, the auto companies, I assume, settled out. The suit was against the little auto parts store in the neighborhood who sold the uh, parts to the person. This is the most famous case, uh, Texas Supreme Court two years ago. Also an auto mechanic who was a lifelong mechanic. Uh, so he had constant exposure to asbestos in brake pads. The plaintiff's experts, rather than attempting to determine what the dose was from that effort, simply said there was some exposure and that's all we need to say to get to a jury in Texas. Before Borg Warner came out, that statement would have been true. Uh, Borg Warner completely changed the asbestos landscape in Texas. Uh, the dockets dropped dramatically. The law firms uh, from Texas, like Waters and Krauss, uh, began to move both their cases and their offices to California, Delaware, and other places. And there's a substantial effort going on right now in Texas to, for the, the, the plaintiffs are undertaking to develop ways to get their cases back in front of those courts down there. It's a, it's a big, big deal. There was also legislation introduced in the Texas legislature to undo this ruling, which would have been interesting. These are a little hard to read. I'm sorry if you can't read them. It's, it's not that important. Uh, the top one is the Martin case, which was a gasket removal case. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, the next one is uh, the underlying district court opinion and the appellate affirmation of that opinion in the Lindstrom slash Bartell cases. Uh, not supported by the medical literature, et cetera. Notice that these courts are focusing on the substantial factor test, and I'm, I'm going to talk about that in just a second. I want you to see the opinions. This is the opinion of the first judge to really kick this whole series of decisions off. Judge Colville in Pennsylvania, a trial judge, wrote what I think is still the best articulation of what's wrong with the anti-exposure theory. Uh, it's a very well done trial court opinion. He took on most of the theories that the plaintiffs used to support their approach and explained why to him they didn't make sense. Uh, this opinion is up on appeal. It's been up on appeal ever since it came out, and uh, we're still waiting to see how that turns out. These two are cases that I was involved in myself. Um, the first one was uh, a case involving um, a gentleman who worked in a shipyard, which is you know, one of the worst places you can be for asbestos exposure from insulation being ripped off ships. Uh, the case, however, was brought to trial against a marine engine manufacturer whose engine had been overhauled, you know, once every two years or something, and the theory was that he must have walked by that engine while gaskets were being removed. That case went to trial. <laughs> That's asbestos land. Uh, we won the trial, but it wasn't without risk. John Crane takes gasket cases to trial all the time, and they have had verdicts of 10 and $20 million entered against them uh, 
in cases where they have gaskets in shipyards and the juries have a tough time understanding that it's not the gaskets, it's the insulation. It's, it's a very tough world once you get in front of a jury. Uh, the second one, uh, well, actually the first one is the first time Dr. Hammer, the one I mentioned earlier, whose testimony had been limited. Uh, the next one that followed the free case, these were two different trial judges in Washington, not the same one. Uh, a written opinion, that's a very good opinion, pointing out that uh, this is a hypothesis, not a proven fact. Oops, let me go back for a second. All right, now let me talk to you just for a second without slides here on what's going on at least, and this is uh, it's obviously the, the defense perspective, and John I know has dealt with this issue a lot, so he'll give you the plaintiff's viewpoint on it. Um, we think that it's illogical to exclude background fibers and then try to include any occupational exposure, and many of these opinions have pointed out the illogic in that approach. By buying into the concept that background fibers are not a cause of disease, the plaintiff's experts accept the notion of dose. That's, that's my argument. Uh, if millions of fibers don't do it, how much does it take? That's a fair question to ask. And then you can't just turn around and say we don't have to answer that question if the exposure is coming from an occupational uh, exposure or a product. That doesn't make any sense. They will, the ex experts will tell you there's no difference in the fibers, they're the same fibers, they have the same potency and everything else. Uh, in my view, it's an artificial uh, litigation construct that's designed to uh, create a scenario under which any company can be sued for any asbestos in their products but leave background out of the equation. Uh, substantial factor, the second point. As you saw in those opinions, if you're in a substantial factor state, and I think Professor Green's going to tell you something about substantial factor in a few minutes. Most of the states that we operate in are substantial factor states. If it's true that every exposure is a substantial factor, what the heck is an insubstantial factor? There isn't one. Uh, the effect of that opinion, if it's allowed to go to the jury, is it shifts the burden of proof to the defendant to prove what an insubstantial factor is. <laughs> And so that's our argument for why a substantial factor state should not allow this theory to be used in the courtroom. It, it is an improper shifting of the burden of proof. Um, no scientific evidence is my third point. Uh, the, um, the scientific literature, to my knowledge, does not state anywhere the proposition that these experts <clears throat> testify to in court, which is every exposure to occupational asbestos above background is a cause of disease. You can't find that in the scientific literature. When I've asked the experts what they rely on for this, they, um, they resort to the no safe dose proposition that I showed you earlier, which you can find with great frequency, but it's a to me, it's a long step from saying there's no known safe dose of asbestos to then turning around and saying, therefore, every dose, every exposure is a cause of disease. Uh, that's a very different proposition. Uh, many of these courts have recognized that that's not the way you go, and courts outside of asbestos have also recognized that you can't rely on government or regulatory um, pronouncements about no safe dose to prove a case in court. Um, the other point with no, no scientific evidence, uh, uh, I almost should draw this for you. The experts use something called the linear no threshold theory. And that's, that's as close as I'll get to something really deeply scientific today, so, so don't panic. Linear no threshold theory. This is a theory that's been around a while. OSHA has used it in their regulations. And if I drew it for you, I would draw you, you all, you all remember your X and Y axis that looks like this. And I'm, and I'm drawing it backwards so you can see it the way it would look to you. Uh, dose here, disease here. If you draw that axis, the epidemiology studies uh, have enough information that you can plot points up in this upper right-hand quadrant up here where disease occurs. And you can draw a line through those points, a regression line. Uh, what the, the question in these cases is what happens when you get to the end of those dots and they only, you know, they stop up here and there's nothing in this lower quadrant. What do you do with exposures down here? The linear no threshold theory says let's assume, let's assume that disease continues all the way down to zero and we'll make it be a straight line. That's why it's called a linear theory. They draw a straight line down. And then you can estimate the number of diseases that will occur from the very, very lowest amount of exposure. That's a theory that is very popular uh, among the plaintiff's experts to support their cases, but when you question them, they will agree and admit 
there's no epidemiology evidence to support that the testimony as to that lower quadrant. It could be a curve that goes like this and drops down, which would reflect a threshold effect. Uh, there's an area where the exposures don't cause disease. Uh, so we've worked with that with the judges and tried to help them understand the distinction between a theoretical linear no threshold theory and proof of actual causation. The best opinion on that issue is the free opinion from Washington because the judge understood that the any exposure theory is a hypothesis, it's unproven, it's theory, and that's all fine. People are entitled to their theories, but she believed that that should not go to the jury as evidence. Uh, the last point on um, uh, What's, what I think is wrong with the theory uh, has to do with idiopathic disease. Idiopathic simply means unknown cause. Most cancers, we don't know what the cause is. And it's true even for something like lung cancer, uh, which has um, uh, uh, mostly smoking as the cause, but uh, there's about 10% of lung cancers that are not due to smoking and we don't know what causes them. The same is true for asbestos and mesothelioma. There's an incidence of idiopathic disease out there. The problem with the any exposure theory is it doesn't leave room for idiopathic disease and coincidental minor asbestos exposure. In other words, if there is any, co any asbestos exposure, the plaintiff's experts will assume the disease is expert cause. But, but that's, to me, that's circular reason, reasoning, and some of the judges have, have understood it that way. Um, instead, it could just be an idiopathic case, and someone happened to breathe some fib fibers in at the same time, caused by spontaneous mutations in the body. Uh, the, uh, there's analogies all over the place that are used in this world, and I'll just share a couple with you. Uh, there's the, the water in the glass analogy, uh, every drop of water contributes to filling the glass, and we all battle back and forth on that. My favorite one is Dr. Frank's analogy. He uses a football analogy, and he says, here's how the every exposure theory works. Every offensive play that the team runs on the field contributes to scoring the touchdown. And I keep wanting, to, I'm looking for the chance to ask Dr. Frank if he's ever seen the Washington Redskins play football. <laughs> I watch the Redskins a lot, being a fan in Washington, and I can guarantee you there's a lot of plays that offense runs that don't contribute to much of anything. <laughs> they don't advance the ball at all. Uh, so you can see how you can take the analogies and make this work back and forth. Uh, take Katrina. Uh, there were lots of storms before Katrina came along. Did those storms contribute to the causation of disease, or to the destruction of the city? Uh, and probably not. It's the big storm that comes along. So that's a little bit of taste for you there on, on what's going on with, um, with the theory. Now let's talk a little bit about outside the asbestos universe. This is occurring outside the asbestos world as well. Uh, this is a sampling. There are certainly more. Uh, in all of these cases, the, the new wave of benzene cases is driven by the every exposure theory. It's, it's a very low-dose case situation. You'll see it there. Uh, these environmental cases, it pops up there with different evidence of proof like biomonitoring, uh, in the bloodstream, uh, trying to prove that regulatory levels are enough to cause the dose, et cetera. Um, my final point is simply that uh, I think the every exposure theory is a bit of a low-hanging fruit. To me, it's, it's a relatively easy target for us to attack. Uh, that doesn't mean the war is over. It's still going on quite extensively. Uh, but uh, uh, th there are tougher ways that we're going to have to deal with this in the future. Some of them are the cumulative doses, if you have enough dose in one job, can you add the other doses to it to get there? Dose reconstruction and epidemiology are the techniques being used in Texas uh, to deal with the rulings there. Medical monitoring and risk-based standards all deal with the concept of no disease. Nothing's happened to anyone. You're looking at future injury, future disease, and the question in front of judges is how much risk, increased risk, is enough to justify the case going to court. I mean, we could do medical monitoring in a whole other seminar, but that's the, the basic principle there. So anyway, that's enough. There's, okay. there's a flavor of, of what's going on with the any, uh, any exposure theory. Thank you.